So on page 569, the term spiritual experience and spiritual awakening are used many times in this book, which upon careful reading, and we all know that alcoholics don't do careful reading, <laughs> shows that the personality change sufficient to bring about recovery from alcoholism has manifested itself among us in many different forms. Okay, the first paragraph, we see something. We see that the term may be spiritual experience or it may be spiritual awakening. And in either case, it's going to be a personality change sufficient to bring about recovery. Dr. Silkworth referred to this as a psychic change, a change in the way we think and the way we feel and our attitude. So we could see several terms, spiritual experience, spiritual awakening, personality change, or psychic change, all meaning the same thing. Spiritual experience happens suddenly, like it did with Bill and some of the people in the back of the stories in the first book. And then we have a spiritual awakening, which develops slowly over a period of a long time. So yet it is true that our first printing gave many readers the impressions that these personality changes or religious experiences must be in the nature of sudden and spectacular upheavals. Well, happily for everyone, this conclusion is erroneous. In the first few chapters, a number of sudden revolutionary changes are described, though it was not our intention to create such an impression. Many alcoholics have nevertheless concluded that in order to recover, they must acquire an immediate and overwhelming God consciousness, followed at once by a vast change in feeling and outlook. Among our rapidly growing membership of thousands of alcoholics, such transformations, though frequent, are by no means the rule. Most of our experiences are what the psychologist William James calls the educational variety because they will develop slowly over a period of time. Now, Bill's was a sudden, spectacular change. Some of the others in the stories in the back of the book were sudden, spectacular changes. But what he's saying here is that most of us, it won't happen that way. Most of us will have the educational variety, and we will change as we learn and as we apply slowly over a period of time. Sooner or later, though, we awaken to the fact that we have changed also, and then we'll call it a spiritual awakening. So it really doesn't make any difference whether it's sudden and spectacular or whether it's a slow thing that involves over a period of time. In either case, it's going to be a personality change sufficient to bring about recovery. Now, I can begin to think with this. I can live with this kind of idea. But when you start talking about what Aunt Much had in the Baptist church, I couldn't live with that idea at all because I was raised in the Southern Baptist church too. And my idea of a spiritual experience was an entirely different thing. Thank God for this appendix that let me know what it really is. A change in my personality. And my personality is made up by the way I think, by the way I feel, my attitude and outlook upon life, people, places, and things in general. That's what determines my personality. I come here restless, irritable, and discontented, filled with shame, fear, guilt, and remorse. If I can change from that to peace of mind, serenity, and happiness, I've undergone one hell of a change in my personality. This educational variety is the type that we're having this weekend, right? We won't be the same after this weekend. None of us will. None of us will. No. See, quite often friends of the newcomer are aware of the difference long before he is himself. He finally realizes that he has undergone a profound alteration in his reaction to life, that such a change could hardly have been brought about by himself alone. What often takes place in a few months could seldom have been accomplished by years of self-discipline. With few exceptions, our members find that they have tapped an unsuspected inner resource, which they presently identify with their own conception of a power greater than themselves. Most of us think this awareness of a power greater than ourselves is the essence of spiritual experience. Our more religious members call it God consciousness. But most emphatically, we wish to say that any alcoholic capable of honestly facing his problems in the light of our experience can recover, provided he does not close his mind to all spiritual concepts. He can only be defeated by an attitude of intolerance or belligerent denial. We find that no one need have difficulty with the spirituality of the program. Willingness, honesty, and open-mindedness are the essentials of recovery but they are indispensable. There is a principle which is bar against all information, which is proof against all argument, and which cannot fail to keep a man in everlasting ignorance. And that principle was contempt prior to investigation. See, I knew so many things that were not true when I arrived in Alcoholics Anonymous. Lifelong theories that were not true. I lived my life on, based upon those things, and they didn't work. And they were so true in my mind that it was almost impossible for me to learn something that was true. 
So I've had to lay, a lie, lay aside a bunch of old ideas to be able to accept new, and I needed an open mind. In fact, I need an open mind more today than I've ever needed an open mind because there's so much more to learn throughout life. Okay, now we pointed out the fact a while ago that Bill loves to teach by using examples of something we already know about to teach us something new. That's what he did when he used the great ocean liner. Another trend that Bill has, and I think it's very important for us to realize it, is like most writers, he did repeat himself quite often. But every time he repeated himself, he would normally find a different word that means the same thing. And if you see what he's doing, you can understand him. If you don't, though, you'll think he's talking about something different. There seems to be one key word in this whole thing dealing with spiritual experience, and that is the word change. Let's see how many times he said change on page 569 and how many different ways he had to say in it. In the first paragraph, he talked about a personality change sufficient to bring about recovery. In the second paragraph, he again mentioned personality changes. But then he said, in the nature of sudden and spectacular upheavals. An upheaval is to change something entirely. In the third paragraph, first sentence, he said, sudden revolutionary changes. To revolutionize something is to change it entirely. Third paragraph, last sentence, he said, immediate and overwhelming God consciousness. To overwhelm something is to change it entirely. Third paragraph, last sentence, he said, vast change in feeling and outlook. Fourth paragraph, first sentence, he said, such transformations. To transform is to change. Fourth paragraph, about the middle of it, he said, profound alteration. To alter is to change. So the key thing here is to change from what we were when we came here to something entirely different up here in our minds. To go from restless, irritable, discontented, selfish, self-centered human beings to go from that to one who has peace of mind, serenity, and happiness and the willingness to help others is an entire change in the way we think. That's a spiritual experience. That's a spiritual awakening. That's a personality change sufficient to recover from alcoholism. That's a psychic change. Now, I can buy into that. To go from what we were to something entirely different in the way we think. Religion has nothing to do with this at all. We make the change through spirituality. It seems that's the only real way that people change is through spirituality. They talked about change, and I told you when I got here, I had become everything I detested in a human being, and I didn't like who I, what I had become or who I was. So they talked about change, and I thought they meant for me to become something that I'm not. So I looked around the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I found me some heroes, some people that I wanted to be like, and we need those heroes in the beginning. I still need my heroes. Charlie was one of my heroes. So I set about to be exactly like Charlie. I didn't like me, so I wanted to be like Charlie. And I almost made it. Thank God I didn't. <laughs> one don't need one, Charlie. But I tried to emulate and be exactly like him because I didn't like me. And that's good. That's good. I needed that. So the type of change I, t- I think they're talking about today is to change from what I had become to that which God intended for me to be. Right. Just me. Just me. And that's a marvelous experience in Alcoholics Anonymous and in life just to become who you are and what God intended for you to be only. And there's only one of those. Thank God. Now let's go back to page 25. He said, if you're as serious an alcoholic as we were, we believe there's no middle-of-the-road solution. We were in a position where life was becoming impossible. And we had passed into the region which there's no return through human aid. We had but two alternatives. One was to go into the bitter end, blotting out the conscience of our intolerable situation as best we could. That's step one, remaining powerless. And the other, to accept spiritual help. That's step two, to accept the need for the power greater than we are. So this we did because we were honestly wanted to and were willing to make the effort. Now we saw where step one the physical allergy, the obsession of the mind, we saw where that came from, from Dr. Silkworth in New York City. Now, you would think that the idea of the spiritual experience 
would have come to us through religious people. Let's look on page 26 and let's see where this idea really did come from. Now we're talking here about a certain American businessman. This is this fellow named Roland Hazard. He was the one that stepped in between Ebby and the judge. said a certain American businessman had ability, good sense, and high character. For years he had floundered from one sanitarium to another. He had consulted the best-known American psychiatrist. Then he had gone to Europe, placing himself in the care of a celebrated physician, the psychiatrist Dr. Jung, who prescribed for him. Though experience had made him skeptical, he finished his treatment with unusual confidence. He didn't go there for a 28-day treatment program. He was with Dr. Jung for a full year. Dr. Jung psychoanalyzed him one day a week for 52 weeks. His physical and mental condition were unusually good. Above all, he believed he had acquired such a profound knowledge of the inner workings of his mind and its hidden springs that relapse was unthinkable. Nevertheless, he was drunk in a short time. More baffling still, he could give himself no satisfactory explanation for his fall. So he returned to this doctor whom he admired, asked him point blank why he could not recover. He wished above all things to regain self-control. He seemed quite rational and well-balanced with respect to other problems, yet he had no control whatever over alcohol. Why was this? He begged the doctor to tell him the whole truth, and he got it. In the doctor's judgment, he was utterly hopeless. He could never regain his position in society, and he would have to place himself under lock and key or hire a bodyguard if he expected to live long. That was a great physician's opinion. But this man still is and is a free man. He does not need a bodyguard, nor is he confined. He can go anywhere on this earth where the other free men may go without disaster, provided he remains willing to maintain a certain simple attitude. Now, some of our alcoholic readers may think they can do without spiritual help. Let us tell you the rest of our conversation our friend had with his doctor. The doctor said, you have the mind of a chronic alcoholic. I've never seen one single case recover where that state of mind existed to the extent that it does on you. Our friend felt as though the gates of hell had closed on him with a clang. He said to the doctor, Is there no exception? Yes, replied the doctor, there is. Exceptions to cases such as yours have been occurring since early times. Here and there, once in a while, alcoholics have had what are called vital spiritual experiences. To me, these occurrences are phenomenal. They appear to be in the nature of huge emotional displacements and rearrangements. Change. Ideas, emotions, and attitudes where once the guiding forces of the lives of these men are suddenly cast to one side. Change. And a completely new set of conceptions and motives begin to dominate them. Change. In fact, I've been trying to produce some such emotional rearrangement within you. Change. With many individuals, the methods which are employed are successful, but I've never been successful with an alcoholic of your description. Asterisk, bottom of the page. For amplification, see Appendix 2. <laughs> Can you imagine this? This is the world's third most well-known psychiatrist at that time. It was Dr. Freud, Dr. Adler, and Dr. Jung. Roland goes to Dr. Jung and is treated for a year. Goes out and gets drunk and comes back. begs the doctor to tell him the whole truth. And this doctor had enough humility to say, Roland, I've done all I can do for you. With my knowledge of the mind and my skills, I just can't help you anymore. You're probably going to die from alcoholism. You know, he could have said, Roland, I think you're suffering from a bad Valium deficiency. <laughs> Let me write you a prescription. You come back for another year. He was a good enough man not to do that. And Roland said, are there no exceptions to this? And this guy was great enough to go out of his field and say, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Once in a while, I've seen people like you have a vital spiritual experience. He said, I don't understand it. It's phenomenal to me, but I have seen it happen. Now, they tell us that Roland tried to get to Freud first, and Freud wasn't taking any more patience. He tried to get to Adler, and Adler was too busy. Jung was the third choice. 
Now, Adler and Jung were both students of Freud, and Jung had fallen out with Adler and Jung on one thing only. Adler and Jung thought all answers would lie within the mind. I mean, Adler and Freud. Jung thought some people might be able to be helped through spirituality. Now, thank God that Roland didn't get to Freud or Adler. We'd be sitting around today psychoanalyzing ourselves <laughs> rather than depending upon spirituality. And unfortunately, that's what we're doing in a lot of our AA meetings, trying to psychoanalyze rather than depend upon spirituality. And what blows my mind to think is this. We alcoholics who are so proud of our 12 steps, and rightfully we should be, I think we need to stop once in a while and remember where they came from. Step one came from a non-alcoholic neurologist in New York City named Dr. Silkworth. Step two came from a non-alcoholic psychiatrist on the other side of the world named Dr. Jung. The last ten steps came from a group of people called the Oxford Groupers who were non-alcoholic practicing first century Christianity to the best of their ability. Everything that you and I use for recovery came to us from non-alcoholics. I think we need to remember that. It might be good for our humility to do so, Joe. Is that odd or is that God? <laughs> you know, I think I think about Dr. Silkworth. He, he knew what the problem was. He observed that through working with 50,000 of us alcoholics, and it became his opinion. But he didn't have a solution for it. Dr. Jung had a solution for alcoholism, the vital spiritual experience, but he didn't know what the problem was. The Oxford Group had a, some tenants that we could work. They had the plan program of action, so to speak, but they weren't in pro involved in the problem or the solution, either one. Begs the doctor to tell him the whole truth. And this doctor had enough humility to say, Roland, I've done all I can do for you. With my knowledge of the mind and my skills, I just can't help you anymore. You're probably going to die from alcoholism. You know, he could have said, Roland, I think you're suffering from a bad Valium deficiency. <laughs> Let me write you a prescription. You come back for another year. He was a good enough man not to do that. And Roland said, are there no exceptions to this? And this guy was great enough to go out of his field and say, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Once in a while, I've seen people like you have a vital spiritual experience. He said, I don't understand it. It's phenomenal to me, but I have seen it happen. Now, they tell us that Roland tried to get to Freud first, and Freud wasn't taking any more patience. He tried to get to Adler, and Adler was too busy. Jung was the third choice. Now, Adler and Jung were both students of Freud, and Jung had fallen out with Adler and Jung on one thing only. Adler and Jung thought all answers would lie within the mind. I mean, Adler and Freud. Jung thought some people might be able to be helped through spirituality. You know, thank God that Roland didn't get to Freud or Adler. We'd be sitting around today psychoanalyzing ourselves <laughs> rather than depending upon spirituality. And unfortunately, that's what we're doing in a lot of our AA meetings, trying to psychoanalyze rather than depend upon spirituality. And what blows my mind to think is this. We alcoholics who are so proud of our 12 steps, and rightfully we should be, I think we need to stop once in a while and remember where they came from. Step one came from a non-alcoholic neurologist in New York City named Dr. Silkworth. Step two came from a non-alcoholic psychiatrist on the other side of the world named Dr. Jung. The last ten steps came from a group of people called the Oxford Groupers who were non-alcoholic practicing first century Christianity to the best of their ability. Everything that you and I use for recovery came to us from non-alcoholics. I think we need to remember that. It might be good for our humility to do so, Joe. Is that odd or is that God? <laughs> You know, I think I think about Dr. Silkworth. He he knew what the problem was. He observed that through working with 50,000 of us alcoholics, and it became his opinion. But he didn't have a solution for it. Dr. Jung had a solution for alcoholism, the vital spiritual experience, but he didn't know what the problem was. The Oxford Group had a, some tenants that we could work. They had the planned program of action, so to speak, but they weren't in pro, involved in the problem or the solution, either one. 
And here's a wholesale miracle that's happened from that moment until this, if you will. He said, but you know, prior to this, he said the exceptions to your case has been occurring since early time. Here and there, just once in a while, alcoholics have had what are called vital spiritual experiences. To me, these are a phenomenon. He went back and joined the Oxford group and, planned, and took the plan program of action of the tenants of the Oxford group, and he recovered. And he was able to help Ebby, and Ebby brought this to Bill. And Bill was over there getting all this other information, jailed in the mind of Bill Wilson, one person. But the miracle is this. Back in those days, it was just here and there, once in a great while. Today, we can look around these rooms at each other and say to each other, here and now, every time an alcoholic will apply these things to their life, they too can recover. And they call it Alcoholics Anonymous. A wholesale miracle has happened. I am not the miracle. The miracle is Alcoholics Anonymous, and I get to participate in it. I think I'll go see Bill now as he finishes up with Chapter 2. Probably sitting down and reviewing what he's told us up to this point. Saying to himself that in the doctor's opinion in my story, I was able to show them the problem. In chapter 2, I was able to show them the solution. Now let's look at a little picture for just a moment illustrating the solution before we go any further. Joe, where is it? No, oh, it's up there. It's up there. And that little picture we have up here on the screen, we've talking about what is the solution. And on the left-hand side of the picture, we see the fellowship which supports us, where the older members, through the sharing of their experience, strength, and hope with the newcomer, provides enough support for the newcomer to be able to stay sober for a period of time. And by the way, it's a two-way street. As we older members support the new member, then we draw strength from that too. Great strength in the fellowship. It'd be almost impossible to be in AA today for very long and not begin to believe there's some power greater than human power working within this thing. When you hear countless hundreds of people saying it's only by the grace of God or because of God as I understand Him, or because of the power greater than I am, I haven't found it necessary to take a drink in X number of days, weeks, months, years, or whatever. You can hardly hear that over and over and over and not begin to believe there's some power working within this thing. The instant the newcomer begins to believe that, that opens the mind, and they become willing to investigate. And upon investigation, we find that simple kit of spiritual tools laid at our feet. The Twelve Steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. As we work and apply those steps in our lives, we undergo a personality change sufficient to recover from alcoholism, and we find the power greater than human power. When that happens to us, we then have become older members of Alcoholics Anonymous. Now we can go back to the left-hand side of the sheet. And we can help support the next newcomer, help them work their program so they can have a spiritual experience also. The book plainly states you cannot give something away that you haven't got. Now somewhere down the line, when they quit working the program out of the book, then in self-defense they started measuring success by how long have you been sober rather than by the quality of that sobriety. In the beginning, everybody was expected to work the program, have a spiritual experience. If they didn't want to do that, they were told, you might as well leave here because we can't help you if you don't do that. So older membership was based on quality of sobriety rather than quantity of sobriety. Now today you see all kinds of people in AA. You see somebody that's been in here maybe six months. they got a good sponsor. They got immediately into the program. They've worked the steps. They've had a spiritual awakening. They're always laughing, cutting up, having fun, always helping AA and doing what they can for other alcoholics. They are a delight to behold, and you just love to be around them. Only been sober six months. You've got others that's been in here six, eight, ten years. Treated it like a cafeteria. 
took some, but left what they didn't want. Now, they're better than they used to be. But you never know what kind of shape they're going to be in when you run into them. One day they're up, the next day they're down. They're kind of like a yo-yo going back and forth. Then you see some people that's been in here 15, 16, 18, 20 years. Never worked a step. Damn proud of it. (laughs) And they're the ones that say, by God, if you want what we've got, and you're willing to go to any damn lengths to get it. You know, some of those guys feel so bad you'd like to buy them a drink. You know they would feel better with a drink, see. So we're not talking about quantity of sobriety here. We're talking about quality of sobriety. And only those that have had the spiritual experience can help another have a spiritual experience. You simply can't give away something you don't have. I see Bill running this all through his mind. And he probably says to himself, they're not going to like this idea of a spiritual experience any more than I did. Do you remember he had an aversion to these things? He and Abby argued about this for a long time. And I think Bill says, I need to tell them just exactly what's going to happen to them if they don't have this spiritual experience. And he writes another chapter, and he called it more about alcoholism. And in this chapter, he talks about one thing and one thing only. He talks about the insanity of alcoholism. You know, step two says we came to believe that a power greater than ourself could restore us to sanity. Well, if we've got to be restored to sanity, that indicates we must be insane. And many alcoholics are highly offended when you bring this up. They say, oh, don't tell me I'm insane. Yeah, I do some pretty crazy, stupid things when drinking. But when I'm sober, I'm much like normal people. Other alcoholics say, well, I don't have any trouble with this insanity because I remember the crazy, stupid things I did while drinking. In either case, they're referring to the stupid things we do while drunk. No, that's not insanity. The stupid things we do while drunk, that's caused by a mind that is filled with alcohol, which lowers the inhibitions. And if your mind is filled with something that lowers your inhibitions, look out. You're going to do some pretty crazy, stupid things, all right. That's why they give all that free booze downstairs. (laughs) (laughs) That's not insanity. That's caused by alcohol itself. In order for us to understand this, we finally had to go back to the dictionary again. And to look up the word sanity or the word sane. And it's defined in the dictionary as wholeness of mind or completeness of mind. If your mind is whole, if your mind is complete, an insane mind is one that is less than whole. To be insane does not mean you're crazy. If you're crazy, that means you've lost more than half your marbles. And you've got to be locked up somewhere to protect you and society from you. That's craziness. But insanity is just less than whole. I think one of the best ways I know to illustrate it is just let's take a pie, set it here in front of us. Let's cut that pie into ten pieces. You come along and I give you a piece of pie. My pie is now less than whole, but hell, I've still got 90% of it. Somebody else comes along, I give them a piece of pie. My pie is now more or less than whole, but I've still got 80% of it. Insanity does not mean you're all gone. It just means you're not quite all here. (laughs) Now, when it comes to alcohol, from time to time, it seems as though we're not quite all here because we can't always see the truth about alcohol. Now, Bill is going to show us this by a series of examples. He's going to give us the man of 30. He's going to look at Jim. He's going to look at the jaywalker. And he's going to look at Fred. And each time, we're going to look into the mind to see if we can or cannot see the truth about alcohol. Let's look at it in just a few minutes. This chapter is called More About Alcoholism. It could be called More Truth About Alcoholism. Now, I've heard all my life, if you know the truth, the truth will set you free. And if you're not free, it's because you don't know the truth. And this chapter here is to give me more truth so I can base my life upon truth rather than upon things that are not true. He said most of us have been unwilling to admit that we were real alcoholics. No person likes to think that he's bodily and mentally different from his fellows. 
Therefore, it's not surprising that our drinking careers have been characterized by countless vain attempts to prove that we drink like other people. The idea that somehow, someday, he will control and enjoy his drinking is the great obsession of every abnormal drinker. The persistence of this illusion is astonishing. Many pursue it into the gates of insanity or death. Now, we learned that we had to fully concede to our innermost selves that we were alcoholics. This is the first step in recovery. The delusion that we're like other people or presently may be has to be smashed. Now, be careful. In these two paragraphs that Joe just read, he has used four different words that all mean the same thing. And if you catch him at it, you know what he's doing. If you don't, you'll think he's talking about something else. He said the idea that someday, somehow someday he will control and enjoy his drinking is a great obsession of every abnormal drinker. Now, we know an obsession is an idea that is so strong it can make you believe something that's true. It can make you believe a lie. The persistence of this illusion is astonishing. We know what an illusionist is. An illusionist is a magician, and they can stand in front of you in a sleight of hand and a few props. They can make you believe something that's not true. So illusion also means to believe something that's not true or to believe a lie. Many pursue it into the gates of insanity or death. Insanity is to believe something that's not true. The next paragraph, he said, the delusion that we are like other people or presently maybe has to be smashed. Delusion means the same thing. If you've deluded yourself, it means you've come to believe something that's not true. So you may see him using any one of four terms. Obsession, illusion, delusion, or insanity. All four mean exactly the same thing. To believe something that is not true or to believe a lie. Let's go over to page 32, second paragraph. Let's look at the lie the man of 30 believed. He said a man of 30 was doing a great deal of speed drinking. He was very nervous in the mornings after these bouts and quiet himself with more liquor. He was ambitious to succeed in business, but saw that he would get nowhere if he drank at all. Once he started, he had no control whatever. He made up his mind that until he had been successful in business and retired, he would not touch another drop. An exceptional man. He remained bone dry for 25 years and retired at the age of 55 after a successful and happy business career. Then he fell victim to a belief which practically every alcoholic has that his long period of sobriety and self-discipline had qualified him to drink as other men. Out came his carpet slippers in a bottle. In two months, he was in a hospital puzzled and humiliated. Now, he tried to regulate his drinking for a while, making several trips to the hospital meantime. Then, gathering all his forces, he attempted to stop altogether and found that he could not. Every means of solving his problem which money could buy was at his disposal. Every attempt failed. Though a robust man in retirement, he went to pieces quickly and was dead within four years. Now, this case contains a powerful lesson. Most of us have believed that if we remain sober for a long stretch, we could thereafter drink normally. But here is a man who, at 55 years, found where he was just left off at, at 30. We have seen the truth demonstrated again and again. Once an alcoholic, always an alcoholic. Commencing to drink after a period of sobriety, we're in a short time as bad as ever. Now, if we're planning to stop drinking, there must be no reservation of any kind, nor any lurking notion that someday we'll be immune to alcohol. Now, we know the truth to be this. Once an alcoholic, always an alcoholic. We've never seen one single case where one of us was able to go back to successful drinking. Now, to believe anything different than that is to believe something that is not true or to believe a a lie. This guy believed that after 25 years of sobriety, he could now drink like normal people. Now, based upon that belief, he took a drink, triggered the allergy, couldn't stop. Four years later, he's dead. Now, is his real problem, though, the fact that he has a physical allergy to alcohol or a form of insanity that tells him it's okay to drink alcohol after 25 years of sobriety. The real problem centers in our mind telling us we can drink rather than in our body that ensures that we can't drink. Let's go to page 34, second paragraph. For those who are unable to drink moderately, the question is how to stop altogether. We are assuming, of course, that the reader desires to stop. 
Whether such a person can quit upon a non-spiritual basis depends upon the extent to which he's already lost the power to choose whether he would drink or not. Many of us felt we had plenty of character. There was a tremendous urge to cease forever, yet we found it impossible. This is the baffling feature of alcoholism as we know it, this utter inability to leave it alone, no matter how great the necessity or the wish. How then should we help our readers determine to their own satisfaction whether they are one of us? The experiment of quitting for a period of time will be helpful, but we think we can render an even greater service to alcoholic sufferers and perhaps to the medical fraternity. So we shall describe some of the mental states that precede a relapse into drinking. For obviously this is the crux of the problem. What sort of thinking dominates an alcoholic who repeats time after time the desperate experiment of the first drink? Friends who have reasoned with him after a spree, which has brought him to the point of divorce or bankruptcy, are mystified when he walks directly into a saloon. Why does he? Of what is he thinking? Our first example is a friend we shall call Jim. Now we're going to look in old Jim's mind just before he gets drunk. And we're going to see whether he is sane or insane. Joe loves Jim. Yeah, I love old Jim. I identify with Jim. <clears throat> Our first example is a friend we shall call Jim. This man has a charming wife and family. He inherited a lucrative automobile agency. He had a commendable World War record. He's a good salesman. Everybody likes him. Typical alcoholic, isn't he? Hmm? He's an intelligent man and normal so far as we can see, oh, except for a nervous disposition. Mm-hmm. Now, he did no drinking until he was 35. In a few years, he became so violent when intoxicated that he had to be committed. On leaving the, treatment, on leaving the asylum, <laughs> he came into contact with us. <clears throat> now, we told him what we knew of alcoholism. They told him about step one, the physical allergy, the obsession of the mind, the powerless condition. And the answer we had found. They told him about step two, the power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. Now, he made a beginning. Step, a little later on, the book says step three is just a beginning. So apparently Jim took steps one, two, and three, and immediately things started to get better for him. His family was reassembled, and he began to work as a salesman for a business he had lost through drinking. And all went well for a time, but he failed to enlarge his spiritual life. The book's going to tell us the only way we enlarge on step three is four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, and twelve, and Jim didn't do any of those. One, two, and three. To his consternation, he found himself drunk a half a dozen times in rapid succession. Now, on each of these occasions, we worked with him, reviewing carefully what had happened. Oh, these were good AA members. <coughs> Jim got drunk six times in a row. Each time they went over there and worked with him carefully reviewing what had happened. You get drunk six times in a row today, they probably won't have anything to do with you. These were good, solid AA members. He agreed he was a real alcoholic and in serious condition. Now, he knew he faced another trip to the asylum if he kept on. Moreover, he would lose his family from whom he had deep affection. Yet he got drunk again, and we asked him to tell us exactly what happened. They're getting a little tired of Jim now. They said, they said my God, Jim, this is seven times in a row. Let's don't go through this anymore. You sit down here, and you tell us exactly how this has happened. Now, on page 36, we're going to see where Jim was sane, and then we're going to see where he went insane. Well, this is his story. I came to work on Tuesday morning. And we read this book for years before we saw this. I came to work on Tuesday morning. <laughs> <laughs> Where was he all day Monday? You know? we God, we're bad, bad about Monday. Bad about Monday. <laughs> now he said, I remember I felt irritated that I had to be a salesman for concern I once stone. Now, I don't think that's insanity. That's probably normal thinking. I think any of us that had to be a salesman for a concern we once owned would probably be a little irritated by that fact, too. That's normal, sane thinking. He said, I had a few words with the boss, but nothing serious. The boss probably said, say, Jim, by the way, where were you all day yesterday anyhow? <laughs> nothing serious, just enough to irritate him. He's a little restless, a little, irrita- a little irritable, and a little discontented. He said, then I decided to drive into the country and see one of my prospects for a car. What's more normal than if you're a car salesman? You want to get away from the shop for a while, drive out in the country, see somebody we already know that we're trying to sell a car to. That would be normal, sane thinking for an alcoholic car salesman. So on the way, I felt hungry, so I stopped at a roadside place where they have a bar. 
I had no intention of drinking. I just thought I'd get a sandwich. What's more normal than if you're hungry to stop in a roadside place to get a sandwich? The fact that they got a bar there is beside the point. We have no intention of drinking. We're hungry. We're going to get a sandwich. Normal, sane thinking for an alcoholic car salesman. I also had the notion I might find a customer for a bar at this place, which was familiar, but I've been going to it for years. I'd eaten there many times during the months I was sober. We're not going in there to drink. We've eaten there many times during the months we're sober. We're going to go in there and get a sandwich and maybe sell a car while we're in there. Yeah. Normal, sane thinking for an alcoholic car salesman. He said, I sat down at a table and ordered a sandwich and a glass of milk. Still, Still no thought order. of drinking. Yeah. What's more normal than to sit down at a table, order a sandwich, and a glass of milk? Normal, sane thinking for an alcoholic car salesman. So I ordered another sandwich and decided to have another glass of milk. If you're hungry enough, <laughs> there's nothing wrong with two sandwiches and two glasses of milk. Unless you're a member of Overeaters Anonymous, you'd better look at it. But that would be normal, sane thinking for an alcoholic car salesman. Two sandwiches, two glasses of milk. Now comes the squiggly writing. <laughs> That's italic. He said, suddenly. Suddenly. That means right now. Suddenly. The thought crossed my mind that if I would put an ounce of whiskey in the milk, it couldn't hurt me on a full stomach. Now, this is absolute insanity, isn't it? <laughs> For this guy to believe that he can take whiskey, mix it with milk, and take it on a full stomach, and it won't hurt him. Now, based on the insane idea, he makes a decision and takes some action. He said, I ordered whiskey and poured it into the milk. And I vaguely sensed I was not being any too smart. <clears throat> but felt reassured as I was taking the whiskey on a full stomach. Now we've got it inside of ourselves. The physical allergy takes over. Now then we can't stop. The experiment went so well that I ordered another whiskey and poured it into the milk. That didn't seem to bother me, so I tried another. Can you imagine how he's going to feel with whiskey and milk back and forth? <laughs> what a hangover he's going to have. Thus started one more journey to the asylum for Jim. Here was a threat of commitment, the loss of family and position, to say nothing of that intense mental and physical suffering which drinking always caused him. Now, he had much knowledge about himself as an alcoholic. Yet all reasons for not drinking were easily pushed aside in the favor of the foolish idea that he could take whiskey if only he mixed it with milk. Whatever the precise definition of the word may be, we call this plain insanity. How can such a lack of proportion of the ability to think straight be called anything else? And if you were looking for a definition of insanity, that would be it right there. The lack of a proportion of the ability to think straight to be called anything else. Now, is Jim's real problem the fact that he has a physical allergy to alcohol? Or that he has a form of insanity that tells him it's okay to drink alcohol mixed with milk on a full stomach? The real problem centers in the mind telling us we can drink rather than the body that ensures that we can't. Page 37, last paragraph. Our behavior is as absurd and incomprehensible with respect to the first drink as that of an individual with a passion, say, for jaywalking. He gets a thrill out of skipping in front of fast-moving vehicles. Now, I, I don't understand this guy at all. <laughs> but I can see him out here on the interstate waiting for a truck or a bus to come down through there jumps out in front of it, spins around two or three times, sees how close it comes can come to hitting him without actually hitting him. For some reason, he gets a thrill out of it. Don't understand him, but I can see him doing it. He enjoys himself for a few years in spite of friendly warnings. People say, hey, Bill, you better quit doing that. You're going to get yourself hurt. Up to this point, you would label him as a foolish chap having queer ideas of fun. Luck then deserts him, and he's slightly injured several times in succession. He's getting a little older now. He can't move as fast. They begin to hit him once in a while. <laughs> Nothing serious. He just kind of bounces off of him. <laughs> you would expect him, if he were normal, to cut it out. But presently he's hit again, this time as a fractured skull. Now, he got hurt bad this time. Within a week after leaving the hospital, a fast-moving trolley car breaks his arm. He gets hurt bad again. Now, he sings their national anthem. He tells you he's decided to stop jaywalking for good. He said, man, I'll never do that again as long as I live. But in a few weeks, he breaks both legs. <laughs> On through the years, this conduct continues, accompanied by his continual promises to be careful or to keep off the streets altogether. 
Finally, he can no longer work. He's just so beat up now he can't hold a job. His wife gets a divorce. She started supporting him and the kids and the hospital bills, and he's held up to ridicule. He tries every known means to get the jaywalking idea out of his head, not his body, his head. He shuts himself up in a treatment center, hoping to mend his ways. But today he comes out, he races in front of a fire engine, which breaks his back. Such a man would be crazy, wouldn't he? Now, you may think her illustration is too ridiculous, but is it? We who have been through the ringer have to admit, if we substituted alcoholism for jaywalking, the illustration would fit us exactly. However intelligent we may have been in other respects, where alcohol has been involved, we've been strangely insane. Strong language, but isn't it true? Oh, I think that's so appropriate today. You know, once again, because of education, many, many people are getting to us before they have to lose everything. Occasionally, you see somebody come in here that's still married. (laughs) Once in a while, they come in and they've got a job. Believe it or not, I saw one come in about a month ago and he still had an automobile. (laughs) And we start talking to those people about insanity. They say, man, don't tell me I'm crazy. I haven't lost anything. I've got my job. I've got my blah, blah. No, uh -uh. we're not talking about that at all. We're talking about one thing and one thing only. Can we or can we not see the truth about alcohol? If we can, we're sane. If we can't, we're insane. Now, the low-bottom drunk like Jim, probably easier for him to see his insanity because he lost everything that he had, period. A high-bottom drunk who hasn't lost a lot of stuff, sometimes it's a little more difficult for them to see it. But I'll tell you, whether you're low-bottom or high-bottom, if you get drunk, you're going to get drunk the same way, believing something that is not true. Let's go to page whatever the next one is, 39. 39. My, my old page is just tore up. I can't read it anymore. And we're going to look at a guy named Fred. Now, Fred is the opposite of Jim. Fred is high bottom. Fred never lost anything. Jim didn't feel too good the day he got drunk. Fred is on top of the world the day he gets drunk. Yet he got drunk the same way he believed a lie. Let's look at his at Fred's lie. Page 39 said, Fred is a partner in a well-known accounting firm. His income is good. He has a fine home. He is happily married and father of promising children of college age. Now, he has so attractive a personality that he makes friends with everyone. If ever there was a successful businessman, it's Fred. Now, to all appearance, he is a stable, well-balanced individual, yet he's alcoholic. Now, we first saw Fred about a year ago in a hospital where he'd gone to recover from a bad case of the jitters. It was his first experience of this kind, and he was much ashamed of it. Far from admitting he was an alcoholic, he told himself he came to the hospital to rest his nerves. We see lots of nerve resters in AA today, just like old Fred is. The doctor intimated strongly that he might be worse than he realized. For a few days, he was depressed about his condition. Now, he made up his mind to quit drinking altogether. It never occurred to him that perhaps he could do so in spite of his character and standing. Fred would not believe himself an alcoholic. He would not take step one. Much less accept a spiritual remedy for his problem. If you can't take one, you can't take two. We told him what we knew of alcoholism. They told him about step one and step two. And he was interested and could see that he had some of the symptoms. He said, I'm a little bit alcoholic. (laughs) Borderline case. He was a long way from admitting he could do nothing about himself. Now, he was positive that his humiliating experience, plus the knowledge he had acquired, would keep him sober the rest of his life. Self-knowledge would fix it. Now, we heard no more of Fred for a while. One day we were told that he was back in the hospital. This time he was quite shaky. He soon indicated he was anxious to see us. The story he told us is most instructive, for here was a chap absolutely convinced he had to stop drinking, who had no excuse for drinking, who exhibited splendid judgment and determination in all his other concerns, yet was flat on his back nevertheless. Well, let him tell you about it. He said, I was much impressed with what you fellows said about alcoholism, and I frankly did not believe it would be possible for me to drink again. And I rather appreciate your ideas about that subtle insanity which precedes the first drink. But I was confident it could not happen to me after what I'd learned. I reasoned I was not so far advanced as most of you fellows, that I'd been usually successful in licking my other personal problems, and that I would therefore be successful where you men failed. 
I felt I had every right to be self-confident. It would be only a matter of exercising my willpower and keeping on guard. Now, this frame of mind, I went about my business, and for a time, all was well. I had no trouble refusing drinks and began to wonder if I had not been making too hard a work of a simple matter. We think Fred began to get drunk right here. He began to say, my, this staying sober is easy, nothing to this. Yeah. One day I went to Washington to present some accounting evidence to a government bureau. I've been out of town during this particular dry spell, so there's nothing new about that. Physically, I felt fine. Neither did I have any pressing problems or worries. My business came off well. I was pleased and knew my partners would be too. It was the end of a perfect day, not a cloud on the horizon. Everything's on top of the world for old Fred. He's doing great, making lots of money, family happy, business associates happy. Everything's good in Fred's life. He said, I went to my hotel and leisurely dressed for dinner. As I crossed the threshold of the dining room... The thought came to mind, it would be nice to have a couple of cocktails and go back to the hospital. <clears throat> now that's the truth, isn't it? No way could he drink on the truth. His mind said it would be nice to have a couple of cocktails with dinner. That was all, nothing more. Now based on the insane idea... He makes a decision, takes some action. I ordered a cocktail in my meal. Then I ordered another cocktail. And we got it inside ourselves now. The allergy takes over. After dinner, I decided to take a walk. When I returned to the hotel, it struck me a highball would be fine before going to bed, so I stepped into the bar and had one. I remember having several more that night and plenty next morning. I have a shadowy recollection of being in an airplane bound for New York and of finding a friendly taxicab driver at the landing field instead of my wife. The driver escorted me about for several days. I know little of where I went or what I said and did. Then came the hospital with unbearable mental and physical suffering. As soon as I regained my ability to think, I went carefully over that evening in Washington. Not only had I been off guard, I had made no fight whatever against the first drink. This time I had not thought of the consequences at all, I'd commenced to drink as carelessly as though the cocktails were ginger ale. Now, is Fred's real problem the fact that he has a physical allergy to alcohol? Or that he has a form of insanity that tells him it's okay to have a couple of cocktails with dinner? The real problem centers in the mind, telling us we can drink rather than the body that ensures we can't. Page 43, last paragraph. You know, Bill had the, the idea that self-knowledge would fix it. And Roland had the idea that self-knowledge would fix it. Fred had the idea that self-knowledge would fix it. Bill's trying to show us through here. They all have the obsession of the mind. And he's trying to show us through the, the illustrations of Man of 30, Jim, Jay Walker, and Fred to tell us one thing. And the last paragraph says, once more. So he just went through all this to, to say once more. The alcoholic at certain times has no effective mental defense against the first drink. Except in a few rare cases, ne neither he nor any other human being can provide such a defense. His defense must come from a higher power. And that is the solution. So you can't heal a sick mind with a sick mind. Self-knowledge won't get it. The more we try to think our way out of it, the deeper into it we get. We must come from a higher power. Our defense must come from a higher power. And you notice he did say the practicing alcoholic or the drinking alcoholic. He just said the alcoholic. Now, what that means to me today is that I have no effective mental defense against the first drink. Left on my own resources, invariably I'm going to go right back to drinking again without the aid of a power greater than human power. Now, if you're the kind of alcoholic that I am, and if you were raised in the church setting that I was raised in, by the end of chapter 3, you are now faced with one hell of a dilemma. Because he's convinced me in chapter 3, without the aid of a power greater than I am, I'm going back to drinking. But I also felt that even though that was true, it would be wouldn't be possible for me to get the aid of a power greater than I am. Because you see, like Joe, I was raised in a good old Southern Baptist church. Now, I've got nothing against a good old Southern Baptist church. It's a great church. 
But when I was a kid growing up, I'm, I'm sure that from time to time they talked about a kind and a loving God. But if they did, the message never got to the pew I sat in. Because <laughs> all I ever remember hearing about God when I was growing up in church was hell, fire, and, brim, and brimstone, and going to hell for lying and cheating and stealing and drinking whiskey and committing adultery. By the time I got to AA, I'd been doing that for about 20-some-odd years. <laughs> And I know that God had already told St. Peter, when that little four-eyed sucker gets up here, send them downstairs, we'll not need his kind. <laughs> and I knew that if God had anything to do with me, it wouldn't be anything good. It would certainly be something bad. I remember so clearly when I separated from God. In that Baptist church I grew up in, they gave me the rules. They said, if you do this, this, and this, you'll be okay. If you do that, that, and that, you're going to hell just sure as anything. Now, I didn't have any trouble with their rules at all until I got to be about 12 or 13 years old. And one day it seemed to me that the preacher looked me straight in the eye and he said, son, to think about doing it is just as bad as doing it. And I said, oh, shit. <laughs> I've had it now because I'd been thinking about doing it for a long time. In fact, I'd been thinking about doing it long enough I was starting to get brain damage from it. <laughs> and I said, if you're going to hell for thinking about it, then you might as well just go ahead and do it. And I did. And I didn't go to hell immediately. And I said, that sucker has been lying to me all along. I said, he and my parents and my teachers have formed together in a conspiracy to keep me from having any fun. And I said, from this day on, I do not intend to pay any attention to what they have to say. I don't have any intention of following God's rules, their rules, or anybody else's rules. From this day on, I'm going to do it my way. And I'm going to do it whenever I want to, and if they don't like it, to hell with them. Now, when I got to AA, I had that attitude of a 12-year-old boy who had defied God, his parents, and his teachers. And I first walked into AA, I was 38 years old, with the spiritual knowledge of God of that 12-year-old boy. No wonder we have trouble with this God thing when we get to AA. Anybody else ever have those kind of feelings about God and people? See? And I think Bill recognized that. And I think he said sooner or later, I'm going to have to ask these people to make a decision about God. And I think he said in his mind that they're not going to be able to make that decision based upon old ideas. And that's what I had when I got here, old ideas. And I think he said, I believe I, I need to give them some new information about God. Where they might be able to discard some old ideas, pick up some new ideas, and then they'll be able to make a decision about this God thing. And he wrote another chapter called We Agnostics, which I think is one of the greatest pieces of spiritual information I've ever read in my life. As I read that and studied that, I could see where some of my old ideas, old prejudices about God and religion were wrong. And when I could see where they were wrong, then I could discard them, and then I could accept some new ideas about God, and then I could make a decision. But based on hellfire and brimstone, based on a God of justice, no way could I have ever made the decision about God. Thank God for chapter 4. Let's look at just a little bit of it just before we go to lunch. You know, Dr. Jung told Roland that ideas, emotions, and attitudes. That's what we're going to be looking at now. Ideas, emotions, and attitudes, which are the guiding force of the lives of these people, are suddenly cast to one side. And certainly the ideas, the emotions, and attitudes that I had toward God were that of a seven or eight year old boy. I couldn't accept it then, I couldn't accept it later. I couldn't accept it when I got here, and I can't accept it today. 
because I need new ideas and emotions and attitudes about this. New information is what I'm trying to say. This chapter, we agnostic. Just the word agnostic means something to me. Gnostic means knowledge. You put the ag in front of it means without. Those are us who are without knowledge. And that was me. And the knowledge that I did have was not good. And Bill had the same experiences that we did. When, when Abby presented him with a solution, he was aghast at that solution. Some of us are aghast at that solution also. And Bill said that whenever they talked to, to me uh, of a God personal to me, he said my mind became irritated and snapped shut against such theories. And certainly that's the way that I did. Later on in the book it says to us that when the spiritual malady is overcome, we straighten out mentally and physically. The spiritual malady. The understanding of God of my understanding. When that is straightened out, we're straightened out mentally and physically. And this chapter here, we agnostic, is an attempt to do that. And as Father Bill Wilson, some of you know Father Bill, said to us many, many times, and I love it. He said that this chapter is not put here to teach me that there's any particular type of religion or type of God. He said this chapter is simply put here so that I might read and question and wonder and get some ideas, emotions, and attitudes, new ones, and open up my mind to a point that God might prove to me there's a God. Now, with that understanding of this chapter, it means more sense, makes more sense to me and becomes extremely valuable in my life. In the preceding chapters, you have learned something of alcoholism. We hope we've made clear the distinction between the alcoholic and the non-alcoholic. If when you honestly want to, you can find that you cannot quit entirely. Because of the obsession. Or if when drinking you have little control over the amount you take. Because of the allergy. You are probably alcoholic. God, isn't that simple? Isn't that simple? You see how people like to expand on things? They took the two questions out of the big book, and some years later they made a little pamphlet that had ten questions in it. And that wasn't enough. They made another one that had twenty questions in it. Hell, I think we're up to 44 today, aren't we? Yeah. Thank God Bill or Abby didn't have the 44 questions with him when he walked into Bill's kitchen. He just said, Bill, has alcohol been bothering your reputation? <laughs> Hadn't had a reputation in years. Then he would have said, Bill, has alcohol been interfering with your sex life? Is anything like I was, he hadn't had any of that in a long time either. There's a statement in the 44 questions that says, do you drink alone? Well, think about it. If I'm buying yes, and if you're buying no. <laughs> <laughs> we had an old friend that used to live in Tyler, Texas. His name was Wino Joe. I've always felt sorry for everybody in AA that didn't get to meet Wino Joe. He was a real character. He's dead now. But Wino Joe had made up his own list to ask yourself to see if you're alcoholic. And the first question on his list was, has the roof of your mouth ever been sunburned? While drinking. <laughs> He said, if it has, you're probably alcoholic. <laughs> I think the second question was, have you ever been arrested for drunk driving from the back seat of somebody else's car? <laughs> the third one I loved was, have you ever been arrested for public drunk while in jail? <laughs> he had a real list of them. We only need these two. I use them all the time. People come to me today, they say, Charlie, you think I might be alcoholic? I say, I have no idea. Let me ask you a couple questions. Have you been able to quit drinking entirely left on your own resources? If they're a real alcoholic, they've got to say no. And then I say, do you have any control over the amount you take after you've once started drinking? If, they got, if they're a real alcoholic, they've got to say no. And then I say, well, you're probably an alcoholic. And that's about as simple as you can make it. Now, if that be the case... You may be suffering from an illness, which only a spiritual experience will conquer. You know, we are very unique people. We number amongst a few people in the world today who suffer from a twofold illness that can only be overcome by a spiritual experience. We also number amongst a few people in the world today who have a terminal illness that we can come out of it in better shape than we were when we went into it. 
if we can have this spiritual experience. We are unique people. Now, to one who feels he's an atheist or agnostic, such an experience seems impossible. But to continue as he is means disaster, especially if he's an alcoholic of the hopeless variety. To be doomed to an alcoholic death... Step one. ...or to live on a spiritual basis... Step two. ...are not always easy alternatives to face. But it isn't so difficult. About half our original fellowship were of exactly that type. At first, some of us tried to avoid the issue, hoping against hope we were not true alcoholics. But after a while, we had to face the fact that we must find a spiritual basis of life or else. Perhaps it's going to be that way with you. But cheer up, something like half of us thought we were atheists or agnostics, and our experience shows that you need not be disconcerted. And I had to stop right here and, and, and see, see, what is my belief as far as this God thing is concerned? And today we find there's only one of three ways that you can believe as far as God's concerned. One way is to be an atheist. Now, an atheist says there is no God. Therefore, they have no power greater than human power to turn to. The atheist would have to stand on their own two feet, run their own show. And I said, Charlie, are you an atheist? I said, no. I've always believed in some kind of God, so I'm not an atheist. I said, well, then maybe you're an agnostic. So I had to go to the dictionary and look that word up. And like Joe said, the word agnostic means without knowledge. An agnostic believes that there is a God. But since we've never tried to use God's power in our life, we've run our own show, stood on our own two feet. We've never received God's power, so we don't know that God exists. We believe in some kind of God, but we don't really know whether that's true or not. And I think that's what most of us are when we get here. Most of us get here with some belief in a God, but we have never turned to that God, and we've been running our own show and standing on our own two feet and doing our own thing. Even though we believed in God, we acted as if we did not believe in them. An agnostic is one without knowledge of God, just belief. Now, if you're an atheist or an agnostic, then the question becomes, how do you become a true believer in God? A true believer is one that knows that God exists. Don't believe it, knows it. A true believer is one who has experienced God's power in their life. And God has given them whatever they need to have a successful life. I don't think any of us get here as a true believer. Because if we knew God and experienced God's power, then we wouldn't have to come to AA to solve our problem. Most of us come here as agnostics. Now, whether we be atheist or agnostic, the question becomes, how do you get from that stage to the stage of one who is a true believer and can receive God's power in our life. Page 45, first paragraph. Lack of power, that was our dilemma. You know, if we wasn't powerless, we wouldn't be here, would we? Lack of power, that was our dilemma. We had to find a power by which we could live, and it had to be a power greater than ourselves, obviously. But where and how were we to find this power? Well... That's exactly what this book is about. Its main object is to enable you to find a power greater than yourself which will solve your problem. It doesn't say which will enable you to solve it or which will help you solve it. It says the main object is to enable you to find a power greater than yourself and then that power will solve the problem. And I find, interestingly enough, from page 45 on in the big book, Alcoholics Anonymous, we don't talk about alcohol anymore. We're through with that. We talk about one thing and one thing only. If you are powerless, whether you be atheist or agnostic, if you are powerless, how do you find the power? And if you can find the power, then the power will solve the problem. Okay, we're going to go to page 46 in the chapter we agnostics. And the book says that, yes, we of agnostic temperament have had these thoughts and experiences. 
Let us make haste to reassure you. We found as soon as we were able to lay aside prejudice and express even a willingness to believe in a power greater than ourselves, we commenced to get results, even though it was impossible for any of us to fully define or comprehend that power, which is God. Much to our relief, we discovered we did not need to consider another, another's conception of God. Our own conception, however inadequate, was sufficient to make the approach and effect the contact with him. You know, my sponsor at that time, George, saw that I had a real problem with this idea about God, and he asked me about it, and I said, yes, I am. I'm having a hard time trying to understand. And he said, well, I've noticed that. He said, why don't you do something that helped him and maybe would help, would help me? He said, why don't you go home tonight and write down on a piece of paper what you would like God to be, laying aside all that stuff you think that you know, and just write down on the piece of paper what you would like God to be. And so I went home that night, and I wrote down some things, and I'm not going to tell you what it is. <laughs> up to you. And I wrote down some things I wanted God to be, and I showed them to George, and he looked at them, and he said, well, that's good, Joe. So you can begin with that. See, I didn't know you could do that. And down in the South, you go to hell for making up your own God. <clears throat> True. You had to believe as they believed. You had to have faith in what they had faith in. If you didn't, you was going to go to hell. But George gave me permission, and I needed that permission to sit down and to say, I would like God to be these things. And he said, that's good. You can start with that, and you can begin with that. And so that's exactly what I did. Where it says, much to our relief, we discovered we did not need to consider another's conception of God. Our own conception, however inadequate, was sufficient to make the approach and effect a contact with him. Now, here's where we can cast aside the first old idea. The old idea that I had was that you had to believe as they believed. And they had me convinced that if you didn't believe as they believed, there's no way that you're going to get anything good when it comes to God. So I was real pleased to find out that I can cast aside that old idea, and then I can have my own conception of God. And like we said yesterday or last night, you know, I find that I've never had any problem with my own conception of anything. And you let me start believing in God the way I want to, then I've got an entirely different idea, an old idea cast aside, replaced with a new idea begins right here. Yeah. And the book says, as soon as we admitted the possible existence of a creative intelligence, a spirit of the universe underlying the totality of things, we began to be possessed of a new sense of power and direction, provided we took other simple steps. We found that God does not make too hard a turn for those who seek him. To us, the realm of spirit is broad, roomy, all-inclusive, never exclusive or forbidding to, to those who earnestly seek. It is open, we believe, to all men. See, all I had to quit doing was saying, no, there's not, no, and start seeking, start saying, yes, maybe, and I started seeking. I said, George, you mean I need to find God? And he said, George, God's not lost. I said, Didn't take me long to figure out who was lost, but I mean, <laughs> he said, he said it's, it's just like the book says, it's in the seeking, it's not in the finding. All I had to do was seek. You know, and that's all this book is asking me to do in this chapter is asking me to seek with an open mind and to wonder and to think. And eventually God will disclose himself to me. And that's exactly what's happened. I was taught as a kid growing up that the way to God was a very narrow path, that if you strayed off either side of it, you were going to get in a hell of a shape. I was taught that God was very, very exclusive, that only those that believed as they believed would be able to make any contact with God. Those were old ideas. Now my book says we found that God does not make too hard terms with those who seek Him. To us, the realm of the Spirit is broad, roomy, all-inclusive, never exclusive or forbidding to those who earnestly seek. Old ideas cast aside, replaced with some new ideas, beginning to find this power greater than human power by changing of the old ideas to new ideas. Page 47. So when therefore we speak to you of God, we mean your own conception of God. This applies too to other spiritual expressions which you find in this book. Do not let any prejudice you may have against real spiritual terms deter you from honestly asking yourself what they mean to you. Prejudice is nothing more than old ideas. Do not let any old ideas you may have against spiritual terms deter you from honestly asking yourself what they mean to you. 
So that's the start. This is all that we needed to commence spiritual growth, to affect our first conscious relation with God as we understood him. And then afterward, we found ourselves accepting many things which then seemed entirely out of reach. But that was growth. But if we wished to grow, we had to begin somewhere. So we used our own conception, however limited it was. And that was the beginning for me. I needed a beginning place, and that's where I started. Now, we need to ask ourselves but one short question. Do I now believe? The agnostic has always believed in some kind of God. Or am I even willing to believe? The atheist can become willing to believe that there's some kind of God. That there's a power greater than myself. And as soon as a man can say that he does believe... The agnostic... Or is willing to believe. The atheist. We emphatically assure him that he is on his way. It has been repeatedly proven among us that upon this simple cornerstone, a wonderfully effective spiritual structure can be built. And again, the axis, please be sure to read Appendix 2 on spiritual experiences. <laughs> again, they want to make real sure that we understand what they mean by those terms. He said it's been repeatedly proven among us that upon this simple cornerstone, a wonderfully effective spiritual structure can be built. Asterisk, bottom of the page, referring to the spiritual experience. So the wonderfully, wonderfully effective spiritual structure we're building is the spiritual experience or the spiritual awakening. And he said the cornerstone of that is to believe or to be willing to believe that there's a power greater than human power. We referred to that once before. The foundation of that structure was step one, which is willingness, now then he tells us the cornerstone of that structure, step two, believing. So we've already put two stones in place. If we can say we're willing, and yes, we believe, or we are willing to believe either one of the two. And he said that was great news for us. For we had assumed we could not make use of spiritual principles unless we accepted many things on faith, which seemed difficult to believe. And there has always been one of my great problems with this God thing. Faith indicates surety. Faith indicates knowledge. Faith indicates after-the-fact information. And one of my problems has always been the minister would say, Son, all you got to do is have faith and everything will be all right. Well, I never could have faith because I had no knowledge of God. I didn't know for sure that God would do anything for me. The best I can possibly do is to start with belief. And there's a big difference between belief and faith. Believe me, there is. A good example of that, let's say I moved into this area here, and three or four months later I've got a problem with my automobile. I don't know a good mechanic anywhere in this area. But we'll say that you've lived here for a long time. And I assume you will know somebody, so I come to you and I say, can you recommend a good mechanic for me? And you say, well, sure. Take your car over there to John. He'll do you a good job, and he'll charge you a reasonable price. Well, I don't know whether that's true or not. The best I can do with that information is if I believe it strong enough, I'll take my car over there to John. And sure enough, he does a good job, he charges me a reasonable price. When I leave there, I know that he will do that. When I went there, I believed that he would do that. Now, six months from now, I have trouble with my car again. I don't ask you or anybody else where to take it. I take it right back to John. This time, I took it on faith, took it on knowledge. You can't start with faith. You can only start with belief. And that's all we have to do. We either have to believe or we become willing to believe that there's a power greater than we are and we're on the road to spiritual recovery. We don't have to know anything. Thank God step two says we came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. didn't say we came to know. didn't say we had faith in that. We just came to believe. And I came to believe based upon what I've read in the book and what you told me, that there's a power greater than I am, can restore me to sanity. I didn't know that. I just believed that. Now, if I know that the beginning of this thing, the finding of the power is just to believe or be willing to believe, 
then the next thing I'm going to have to know is what procedure am I going to follow in order to find that power. Let's go over to page 51 for just a moment.